you go to escala-exercises.47deg.com, I'll have a link on that later on, on the presentation. Uh, this is basically a way for uh, people that are getting started in the Scala world to have a quick uh, taste of what a Scala feels like and uh, kind of like go over uh, different cone style exercises. I'll show you guys a little example here in a second. So basically you can complete the exercise. The resolution is kind of off on, on this projector, but uh, you can uh, complete exercises and it actually, it shows you life whether you got it right or wrong. And it goes from the most simple cases going advancing towards uh, more complex uh, features of the language. So this was actually originated because uh, we have 47 degrees, we needed to hire Scala developers. They're super hard to find, so we needed to convert a bunch of Python, PHP, and other developers to Scala. And, we, and a lot of the uh, rationale of uh, this project was uh, we wanted to give them like a quick and easy way to try the Scala language without having to commit to install SBT and so on just to get a feeling of that's something they like or not, right? Also, it helped a lot of the people in the community to get started with Scala from the very beginnings. So this is version one. It uh, has a lot of limitations. I'm gonna show you a little bit uh, of those right now. And we are right now working towards version two. So basically, it's a browser tool, right? So on the browser, you need to install anything. You can go and try and, and play with different exercises. They're all cone style but also we're uh, working in a different style for version two. And uh, it was initially created by Rafa, he's right there, so if you guys have any more questions, you can also ask him. Uh, he, it was a proof of concept for, for the 47 degrees lab, which is as, uh, every like two weeks or so, each one of us kind of like creates a proof of concept, shows it to the team. If the team likes it, uh, if we think it's something valuable for the company, well, we go on and then kind of like try to open source it and make something out of it. And this is how it started. So it went live uh, about a year ago, and it's been going on, version one, it's been focusing on uh, porting all of the Scala cones that Dick Wall and many others wrote, and they were available as uh, SBT Scala projects to actually bring them to the web. And it, we wanted to bring a social component to the platform, so uh, if you visit the web later, you'll see that you can comment on the exercises, you can collaborate with people, you can discuss what the possible solutions are. So that's something that you don't really get with SBT or your IDE when, when you're coding. So that's something we wanted to bring the community to solve a common problem and then what's the best solution and what's wrong and what's good. So it had a tons of limitations. Uh, one of them is uh, it's completely a client-side application, 100% written in JavaScript. And the reason we did that is because like, we didn't know if it was going to get acceptance. So in order to avoid server costs and a lot of complexity, we wanted to like, launch something, see if people liked it. And if they did, we were going to improve and iterate over it. Uh, so the evaluation was also because it was JavaScript, uh, we couldn't really evaluate real Scala code. So all the evaluation was constrained to, you have a cone style exercise, then you have to provide an answer. If that answer fits within those regex expressions, then it'll be a good answer and then you'll get it right. And we use uh, HTML local storage to uh, keep track of your progress in, in that session. And the problem was, again, like because we're using no server, don't, if you go to your cell phone or another computer, unless you're uh, sharing some kind of like uh, state with Chrome and local storage, then you have to start all over again. And Despite all of those limitations, uh, we found out that actually had really good acceptance in the Scala community. So s for the last year, we got over 63,000 unique sessions, not just Scala developers, but tons of people that wanted to try how it felt to code in Scala. 40% of those sessions returned back to complete more exercises. I got a total of 180 PRs fixing, you know, like the different regrets for the answers and things that people were discovering. 50 contributors so far, and uh, the most amazing thing for me is like every, like almost all of those 40% people that came back completed a whole section. So I'm gonna show you guys what a section is, but a section basically is a collection of exercises. So if you think about uh, Scala, collections, uh, immutable list, well, all of the different combinators, that would be a section. So people actually took the time to go through each one of those and complete them. 
So now we are going with a new iteration on V2. And uh, I wanted to show you guys what, what's in it, because I think it's going to be really uh, great for the Scala community. So this new iteration was largely based on uh, Eric's uh, talk at the Scala World. Uh, he kind of showed us, like, we need to simplify things. We need to be uh, welcoming to new members in the community. And we thought that, well, that is great. And with la while libraries try to do that, there's just still a lot of abstractions and complexity that newcomers have to go through to actually get to that point. So we wanted to bring each one of those libraries to actually the web, to the browser. So in this uh, a new section, we're going to focus not so much on the standard library. The standard library is going to be just one more library like any of the other ones. And we're going to have exercises for all the different libraries, cat, shapeless, and so on. We're also going to have a server piece and component, which we're going to keep track of all of the user progress. And we're using the GitHub API to do that. So you can log in with your GitHub account, which I'm assuming everyone has one. And then you can go on into any library that you're interested in learning about, and then complete the exercises for that library. We are also keeping track of the library progress. So if you're doing a, the, the resolution is not very good here, but this is uh, an example for cats. Um, if you're doing like all of the exercises for cats, you can keep track how many sections you've completed. So imagine having um, learning about XOR, learning about I don't know, uh, code product or inject or all of these uh, cool type classes and, and data structures. And we wanted to bring a complete different approach on how you actually write exercises. So we're hoping that a lot of the people that care about their libraries and want newcomers to learn about them provide exercises for their libraries. So as an example, what we are doing so far is we've taken a few of the CATS uh, tutorials that they have on their site, and we converted them to exercises. And we did the same with some of the shapeless uh, uh, tutorials for HList and so on. And uh, we've come up with an approach where if you just write a class on your library and you use a Scala doc and just a standard method syntax, like if it was a unit test, we have a, a way to transform that into what's going to show up on the web. So here you see on the left side, this is a class for the identity uh, section of CATS. It has all of the identity information that they have on their tutorial. It is stem flat spec because it uses a Scala test for the actual uh, cone evaluation in this case. And uh, you just provide a method. I mean, you don't really see it here, but anyway. So here, um, so here you're just going to have a, like an input parameter. And that input parameter is going to be a placeholder for the actual evaluation result that you are proving. So here we're saying, OK, if we create an a identity monad of int, and we can automatically coerce that to a number, 42, then we can say that this value is going to be, and then rest zero int is what the user types on the browser. So we actually invoke your class that you wrote. If the test passes, then you get a positive result. If it fails, the matching, you get a negative result, and a brief uh, description at the bottom that you know, it's not complete. So Scala doc on the top for the section content. Uh, any Scala doc annotating a method to actually describe the exercise content and method that are the actual exercises that get evaluated in the runtime. Uh, you don't see, it. this is a video, you don't see it, but uh, I'll post the slides, you guys can uh, take a look later. But basically, type the wrong value, type the right one, the green thing comes up, then that exercise is done, and the thing is added to your progress. At any point, you can go back, change the, the answer if you want to try something else, and you could actually evaluate complex expressions. It's not just constrained by regular expressions anymore. Something we wanted to really make emphasis is that we want people to be accredited for what they've done. So if you contribute to Scala exercises, whether it's content or whether it's a actual exercises or to the actual platform that does all of this work, you will be properly contributed by inspecting the Git blame and then showing your face on all the exercises. Sorry. So, so 
not only we show like the faces of people, but we actually uh, kind of like squash commits and show like this is what this guy's done for this exercise. So if you want to improve something, you know, you'll be creative. And we want you to contribute to Scala exercises. So I'm gonna do a very quick pass on what's inside it to see if it's interesting to you. So we have an exercise compiler that Andy, right there, raise your hand, Andy, he wrote. <laughs> so it parses all of the source content. It actually uses the Scala compiler to do a lot of the heavy lifting, and it's expressed as an SVT plugin. What does that mean? We don't need to, you don't need to create the content in your repo. You can create it in your own repository. You can publish the artifacts with this plugin, and then just create a pull request in your repo to include the dependency, so we automatically discover all those exercises and publish them for you. So for the client, we're using Scala JS and CATS. For the server, we're using CATS, DUI, and PLAY. And we have a different architecture for the client and the server because we are pretty pragmatic. So we wanted, so we talked to the front end developers, and they wanted to go with more of like a flux style architecture. So we have basically like a UI action state combination with effects over IO custom monads that we have on, on the front end. So it's also purely functional but it reflects more of like the type of work you do on, on the client. Whereas in the server, we have more of like a free model approach over CAT. So we've modeled all of the operations with free algebras that are combined in a code product. And we have different interpreters that for uh, production, they run over task or lift to future because play uses features. And then on test, we use identity or whatever target uh, type is uh, more appropriate. And um, I, think, I think it's a good example to that functional programming is not only for libraries or for like super hardcore abstract, abstractions. Like you can actually do pretty visual and real apps with it. And it was uh, all nice and profit on the free land until last night. <laughs> I talked to Stu. <laughs> we met for the first time actually last night. And he kind of had a different opinion on the naming, but so we ended up agreeing that it's not really free monad, it's like monadas libres, so now you know how to say it in Spanish. Because <laughs> Spanish really captures the concept of the, what, what means free monad, not saying free beer. So B2 is under very heavy development right now. This is a chart for the last year. These are all like PR contributions for different like, you know, exercises, evaluations. But this right here is what's happening right now. So we're in, a, in crunch mode. We expect to have something done by uh, the end of March, beginning of April. Still a good time to contribute. Uh, take a look at the code, see if we're doing something that we can, can be improved and, and be part of it. And so we're actively working on better evaluation. We're going to have problems, right? If you send me like a wild loop in the thing, you're going to kill my web process. So we're working on an evaluator that is going to run on separate processes, potentially on different servers. And we're considering Finch for, for doing that. We want to support block style exercises. So if we're using cats, I mean, cone style is cool, but at some point you have to implement your own type classes, right? So you got to type more than just a few uh, words. And we're working on a contribution guide and, and documentation to help people get started that are actually going to contribute in the platform. And we're going to split what we have right now in a single repo in multiple repositories, which is going to be compiler, um, a few of the content that we're, like for the standard library that we're actually hosting ourselves, and uh, the actual site or web application plus the, the evaluators. For V3, we're already talking what we want, would like to have. Something we, ha we want to have is like allow GitHub organizations. So if you log in with your GitHub account and you use your organization, if your organization has declared some metadata for some particular libraries that they want you to learn, we will show those up there and then help you learn those. So if you're working in a shop that does a lot of Spark, then you can access the Spark content. Or if you're working with ACA or any other library, it can be there. So also you can create your own exercises and publish them and then they will be kind of in a way uh, just for you or whoever wants to activate those. We want to support other exercises format. Um, there might be cases where people already have like libraries that have been written with uh, TUT or some other documentation tool, 
And it's possible to actually write a compiler for that and evaluate it in the same way we're doing with uh, source code. So that's something we want to do. And we're also considering like moving Scala exercises outside of 47 degrees, uh, the company, more to a top level organizations to have other people that are interested in the community or the companies uh, contribute uh, as well. So it's up to you, and that's all I have. <laughs>So will you be um, thinking about supporting things like um, versioning of uh, libraries that you're um, doing exercises off of? Yes. So one of the challenges is versioning. Uh, like, what happens if we change the runtime of the evaluator to a new Scala version and the library you have has a different uh, version? So there's a little bit of research in that area. And is doing most of it. We are considering. Um, doing some trick with class lawyers and stuff to support versioning. It's not a top priority at the moment. We're expecting people to be at a latest Scala version in order to create like the best experience for the users. But definitely something we're considering. Um, I, I, I thought this you were going to ask my question. What about the, um, the evolution of versions of, of the libraries themselves? I mean, so I've just released Shapeless 230. There are changes, additions. Uh, how, what, 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 process do you envisage for supporting uh, that kind of evolution? And also, I guess, the fact that you know there are different versions of popular libraries in active right. use concurrently. Right. So basically, uh, the artifacts produced by the compiler are linked to a specific uh, library version. So they will work. Like if, if, if an author decides not to update the library, it will still be running on that version. But let's say you go from what, two version whatever to 2.5, uh, we actually define in the in the actual artifact what version of the shapeless libraries, for example, this artif this exercise artifact is gonna depend on, and we resolve uh, the transitive dependencies. So when we have to evaluate the actual code, it uses the right version of the library. So that's one of the reasons too why we're moving the evaluator to its own process and its own definition, because we don't want that to, for example, we're using shapeless on on the actual site project. So there might be mismatch of versions in that case. So we want that process to be completely separated from the from the actual code that you see on the on the browser. I don't know if I answer your question. No, well, kind of. You you answer the more technical bit. I, I guess, but there might be different versions of the exercises that you want to present to people based on different versions. So I mean, there's still people out there using Shapeless one point uh, right. two because of spray dependencies and things like that. It's a whole load of things which. Um, you know, someone might want to learn about that, but the, the the way that they would do that is very different from the way they do it with the current version of Shapeless. Right. So um, perhaps when I say libraries is the wrong word. Like it's not just libraries; it's anything. So you can have multiple sections, like we showed in the homepage, uh, that are actually indexed and searchable and browsable that are for different versions of, a, of the same library. It's not only constrained to libraries. Like say you have uh, something we're working on right now; it's actually putting the Functional programming and Scala book contents and, and examples uh, to similar exercises. So the, ex the, the actual content for the book will be available in Scala exercises if the authors uh, allow it. So it, it can work for really anything, not just uh, per se Scala libraries, but anything that can be demonstrated as something useful for, for the community to complete exercises. Mm -hmm.